Welcome everyone to a very special edition of Black and Asul. Uh, I'm Jamin Moore, your host for today. I'm joined by Joel Soria, and we're joined by Jeff Ruder of The Athletic. Jeff, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me, Jamin. So you've been very busy around all things Minnesota United, all things USL. You recently reported about the U23 league, which we'll get into a little bit later. Talk a little bit to us about all the things that you cover for the athletic in terms of soccer. Yeah, it's a lot, isn't it? Uh, and it feels like it keeps growing. And I think that covering soccer in 2020 also means that you're covering uh epidemiology you're covering social issues you know it's 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 not just who kicked a ball and how well they kicked it uh, but overall yeah I'm in my second year as a staff writer for the athletic I'm one of six major league soccer writers Minnesota United tends to be the main focus of my beat I've been covering them since the 2015 NASL season but then you also have a lot of coverage across that league as well as the United Soccer League the second and third divisions of U.S. soccer and a lot of my purview, of course, then will include the league, which Reno 1868 has competed in throughout the past few years. So we're kind of converging a lot of topics that we talk about normally on Black and Asul here because this is an earthquakes oriented show. We talk a good bit about Reno 1868 FC from time to time. We've had their coach Ian Russell on the program a couple times this year. And all of a sudden we get breaking news this week. You broke the news on Wednesday that a player that you had identified as a top MLS prospect out of USL, Sam Gleadle of Reno 1868 FC, an outside back, he plays can play both on the right and the left, although mostly on the left this year, was going to sign with Minnesota United FC. Um, talk to us about uh, about Sam and and you know what is it that uh, that you think Adrian Heath is seeing in him, and why is now right before the playoffs the time to bring him in? You think some background. I, and I mean this as no no sort of like hedging why Sam and then two other Reno players have signed with Minnesota United over the last week. However, it is important context to understand that Minnesota United has been ravaged by injury ever since play resumed outside of the bubble in August, uh, outside of the Orlando tournament. They currently have four players confirmed to be out for the rest of the regular season, probably a fifth, if we're being honest about Osvaldo Alonso, who picked up a, a, another hamstring injury in their game midweek. So then you have five players there. You also have three or four players who have had continued, whether it's leg muscles, ankles, uh, other sort of hindrances that keep them out of playing a full 90 minutes each and every week, which has made Adrian Heath rotate his side much more than he tends to. He tends to be a coach who likes to eventually identify a best 11 and trust them to be able to do the job whenever they can. So in that sense, Sam Gleadle does help fill a role because left back Chase Gasper has been out. Uh, there's, there's no, there's, he's not on an injury report or anything. So in 2020, you tend to assume that that means that there's something else that's going on that's keeping him out for two or three games at a time, uh, which is the unspoken giant elephant in every single room in the world these days. But I, I think that as you're looking at Sam Gleadle, he is a player who can play on the left and the right. He can play up on the wing as well. Minnesota United does need some wing players who are, confident in backtracking a lot of the wingers that have been playing for them regularly don't like to leave the attacking half of the field feeling like they can't make that up if there's a counter attack that they're not quick enough or maybe that they're not willing to make that sort of lung busting run five times a game which then means that the left backs get pulled out of shape the right back as well gets pulled out of shape and then the whole defense is a little bit more stretched out a good two-way winger like they used to have with Miguel Ibarra has been sorely missed in the 2020 season so to that end a versatile player with a green card worth keeping in mind like Sam Gleadle fits into that roster very nicely uh, I'm sure that they were able to get him I think his contract was due to expire at the end of the month of November anyway, or at the end of his USL contract. So it made it very easy for him and a couple of other players to step in. Of course, they won't be able to play this weekend if Minnesota United's game happens. However, they will be eligible, if not midweek for their game against, I believe it's the Chicago Fire, then their season finale. They would at least have three additional players, plus the postseason, which Minnesota has now officially clinched due to the change to points per game. There's the two other players that you mentioned, we both learned about on Thursday, and they were revealed by Minnesota United on Friday. Two more Reno 1868 FC players, one of them, Foster Langsdorf, former Stanford player, um, also uh, was in the Portland Timbers organization, scored in, in nine of his last 10 games with Reno 1868 FC. 
was also named as one of the players and also a former San Jose Earthquakes player, Kevin Partita, who played with the team some in 2018, had a Reno contract this past year, um, also was named. A couple, you mentioned that there's players with injuries. You know, those, that's at a position of need as well, that particularly Kevin Partita comes in and fills. Foster Langsdorf, a lot of people were projecting him to also be a potential MLS player. How do you think Adrian will get to use these players, uh, you know, coming up here? I think maybe the, first of all, it's worth noting, I expect both all three players will be used. I don't think that this is necessarily just a security blanket. This is not necessarily players to fill roster spaces to make sure that you're traveling more than seven players now that your bench can be maximized up to a 20 man match day squad. But I I think that you're then looking at, uh, you know, needing help in the midfield, like you said, with Alonzo being out with Hassani Dotson, one of last year's finalists for MLS rookie of the year. He has also been out after a horrific challenge from Houston Dynamo defender, uh, Adam Lundqvist about two weeks ago. So they have been missing their two true number sixes. They have Jan Gregor's a Slovenian international. He is more of a box to box type of guy, but he can sit at home. There's Ja'Cory Hayes, the former super draft pick from FC Dallas, who was traded for a third round pick this off season. He has been deputized in that midfield position, but he too has a bit of a leg muscle injury with his groin. So you really are very thin in that central midfield. You also look at a player like Kevin Partita, who has looked like he is on the cusp one of those players that you look at and say there might not be much more that he can accomplish in the USL championship. The question then becomes what kind of team would take, uh, you know, take a gamble on him. It's a very low cost gamble to be fair too. We're talking about, you know, pull tabs, not necessarily the Russian roulette at Vegas on a Saturday night, but at that point, then you're looking and you're saying, okay, well then how are we able to incorporate this player? Well, we have an automatic need. We know that he's fit. We know that he's played at a high level for the league. Let's see how he does uh, with a pretty, manageable sort of tactical usage. He, he wouldn't be asked to do anything that's too adventurous. As for Langsdorf, there's been no position group for Minnesota United that has been more of a failure in the 2020 season than their strike core. They went out, they, they lost um, Angelo Rodriguez, the former designated player from Colombia, and, and they replaced him with a Paraguayan Tam Loney, Luis Amaria, who immediately promised he would score 25 goals. Now, of course, the season did not fit anything close to what he was expecting when he made that projection. However, since their first two games against San Jose and Portland, where Amaria scored in each in March, if you can remember back that far, ever since then, Amaria has been in and out of the lineup due to injury. It looks like he's going to need a surgery at this point on his ankle. So he is likely done. Kai Kamara was traded for to be sort of that new number one. He has struggled to acclimate to the Minnesota United lineup. Frankly, hasn't really kept the pace of a quicker moving team as Minnesota tries to keep a higher tempo than the Colorado Rapids do his team from the first half of the season. And then they traded away Mason Toy, their first overall or their top pick, their seventh overall pick from the 2018 Super Draft for $600,000 of general allocation money to the Montreal Impact. So their strike fleet has not been close to as productive as a former striker like Adrian Heath would want so to that end Foster Langsdorf does have a golden opportunity to get some good minutes could possibly feature in the MLS Cup playoffs and then from there anything's possible for a 24 soon to be 25 year old striker. Joel let's bring you in here because you know this is a situation that that I think many Quicks fans have a problem with because these at least two of these players are in positions of need for the earthquakes as we speak they're not very deep in the middle of the pitch at the defensive midfielder position. They're uh, very much not deep at all right now at the forward position that that Foster could occupy. How did this happen, do you think, where the Quakes let players like this go from the Reno organization where they have had an affiliation for the last three years and go to Minnesota United? What are you hearing from inside the club? Well, I think it's pretty simple, right? Um, I think that to certain people within the Quakes organization, you could say that the or, that the partnership between the Quakes and Reno doesn't really exist. Um, what what I was told recently uh, by a source close to to Reno was that the or the the partnership between Reno and the Quakes uh, is due to expire, as we know, at the end of this calendar year, and there are talks of, of not extending that, that partnership uh, beyond 2020. So from, from what it sounds like, Reno and the San Jose Earthquakes will no longer have a partnership, at least on paper. Uh, I, I did also hear that there are possibilities that 
the both both teams will be able to continue to have a, a partnership that is a bit less uh, formal. Um, as we know, there there is uh, definitely a connection there with Ian Russell, who is a longtime assistant at the San Jose Earthquakes and also a former player, MLS Cup champion. Um, so there's always, I think, a, po- a possibility that both teams can can seal deals in the future. But but as we know, I mean, we'd be lying to ourselves if we said that Matias Almeida has relied on on Reno 1868 FC. Um, to, to maneuver players in and out of San Jose. And, and Ian's name was very frequently brought up, Joel, uh, more recently when the club was struggling as a potential successor from Matias Almeida. Almeida indicated that he was going to have or, or had had a discussion, and, and, and Jesse as well, uh, with the owner of the San Jose Earthquakes, uh, um, John Fisher. And in that conversation, apparently there was – discussions about the types of players that Matias would potentially need in order to be able to go forward with the club. Um, and I think a lot of fans were, were looking at the potential of Fisher saying no and bringing Ian in as the coach. The calls for that seem to have subsided at this point, at, at least from the fan perspective. How do you see this playing out? Because uh, Ian's contract is with Reno 1868 FC and that contract, or sorry, is, is with the earthquakes, not Reno 1868 FC. And that contract is also ending. Where does this leave uh, the future of Ian Russell with the club in your opinion? It's tough to say. It's, it's really tough to say there, you know, for sure. Ian Russell has been one of the better coaches in America's second division. Right, he's proven time and time again that he's he's up up to the part to, to to be in that top percentile of of USL championship coaches. Um, there's a lot of people uh, within the American soccer circles that would like to see Ian Russell as an MLS coach. I don't know if the time is right as of yet. I would imagine that Reno is definitely contemplating and bringing uh, Ian back because he's done a stellar job time and time again. Um, and he obviously is, is very cognizant of what is needed um, in, in USL and what is needed to make it back up to MLS, right? He was a longtime assistant of uh, Dominic Kinnear, uh, who is now going to be taking over uh, the Los Angeles Galaxy. So I think that there's definitely legs to him staying in, in Reno. I think it's, it's, a, it's a really a perfect match. Um, the communication between Reno and San Jose would still uh, remain, obviously not at, at an official level, but I think that there would still be a relationship there given, you know, the longtime partnership. Um, it's tough to say, really. It's tough to say, Jamin, uh, without speculating, but um, I, I would definitely vote for, for Ian uh, to stay in Reno uh, if an MLS opportunity doesn't come around. And Jeff, we're, like I said, we're so excited to have you on the show because this is right in your wheelhouse here. You have, again, uh, you have uh, talked recently with the, uh, in, in the athletic about the U23 league and the possibility of that. You also cover USL. For Reno 1868 fans that are, that are watching right now, they've just seen three of their best players now taken, you know, into MLS. Um, and they're not sure what's going to happen with Ian Russell. But when Ian has been so successful with four times in the playoffs in all four years in Reno, he's also moved several players now from uh, USL to MLS. What encouragement could you give to uh, Reno fans at this point who may be wondering how they're going to remain competitive losing three players like this so quickly? Yeah, there are very few clubs in the USL that have built a reputation of being those sort of springboard clubs. You talk about these sorts of clubs much more in other countries in the world where maybe there is an open system, but you will see certain kind of mid-market, smaller market clubs that players will flock to in hopes of being picked up by a larger club. The same sort of thing has already happened with Reno. There are a few other clubs you could probably point to as well, like Phoenix Rising, like Louisville City. Um, But Reno is chief among those clubs. And and you've seen the way that Reno has built a roster is not dissimilar 
to what the Real Monarchs did uh, over the past few years, where what they would do is they would look for some of those next uh, best players who are thriving on independent clubs, but maybe aren't necessarily getting that same sort of look from MLS offices, bring them into an MLS two team. They were able to play last year. Real Monarchs were able to win uh, the USL championship final, but then those players also were able to move up with Real Salt Lake. And you're seeing some of those with like the Justin Portillo's, the Michael Chang's next year. You're going to see that as well with uh, Andrew Putna, who's started a goalkeeper for them some this year. And you also are going to see it with Noah Powder and a couple of others who have been part of the USL side for a while. Usually people would assume then that San Jose would do something very similar, which just hasn't been the case. And it's not for a lack of talent. So instead, what you've seen is that other clubs have identified Reno as a club that is absolutely worth monitoring. Ian Russell being a coach who is very good at understanding how to get the most out of a player while also being realistic when contacted, because that is a part of every single transfer usually is asking the former coach what they think of these players. He is someone who, when he says they're MLS ready, he knows MLS ready. He's not necessarily somebody who's going to have a sort of disillusion or, or maybe some sort of uh, misunderstanding of what that sort of player needs to have to be able to make that leap. So to that end, Reno has become one of those clubs that MLS teams do trust in terms of finding, uh, you know, buy low options within the USL. But now there's going to be competition for players, right? Because uh, there's going to be, you reported recently uh, that there's going to be a resurgence of the reserve league. That's what it used to be. The new incarnation of that appears to be a U23 league while not yet formally announced How is the potential of this league kind of overhanging uh, the state of USL and second division soccer and third division soccer right now? And how are MLS teams preparing for the potential of this league, uh, you know, emerging? Yeah, it will be much more of a mission critical sort of outside impact on the third division league one than it will be for the second division championship. The championship had started to whittle down its number of MLS affiliates. Some of them were jumping right down to the third division. Some had pulled out entirely over the last few years. And as a result of that, that league became much more independent club driven rather than reliant on MLS affiliates for the stability. The question then was just, are you going to have the Real Monarchs, the Red Bulls too, uh, the the Galaxy too, some of these teams that are often very competitive and I would throw in Swope Park Rangers turn Sporting Kansas City too, or are they going to be some that are just there for uh, training opportunities and injury recoveries? Those teams by and large will pull out of the league. There are three teams that are pulling out already for 2021, uh, Portland Timbers two, Philadelphia Union two, used to be Bethlehem Steel, and then Orlando City B from League One. So in that sense, League One now is a much smaller league. It already does only have 11 participants this year because Toronto FC2 bypassed playing in 2020 due to the difficulties of Canadian teams being able to play in the United States. But as you're looking moving forward, they're still back to 11 teams for the 2021 season. That's a precarious position because you don't know necessarily, depending how this offseason goes, you might have more clubs that need to take a hiatus year or need to fold entirely due to the coronavirus. Again, this is a situation that we have no playbook for. We have no predictions of what's going to happen this winter. But as you're looking at a team like Uh, I guess, San Jose Earthquakes. If you have this informal relationship with Reno, you can now decide based on your academy, where's a better place to put your player? Are you going to found a reserves U23 team, which then is for the players who are just leaving your U19 level of your academy with MLS next? But maybe if that player looks a little bit better, maybe that that player has been proven at that level and just needs to get a better level of competition. Then you contact Reno 1868 and say, hey, we have a player who's ready for loan. I don't think he's quite ready for the MLS level. He's not ready to play for the Quakes. However, I think that he could help you out and, and we would, you know, he could challenge for minutes if he's able to beat out your 23, 24, 27 year old USL veterans. That's a good indicator that they've made the progress where you can start to kind of dose them into MLS action. And Joel, uh, let's let's revisit kind of the situation for the earthquakes here, because, uh, you know, as we know, the team has not made any moves at all in the secondary transfer window. They didn't take the option to bring in any of these Reno players. They didn't bring any players from the outside. What do you think, you know, the team is is looking at right now in terms of, of, you know, addressing this roster in the off season, given these situations. And do you think that the team is going to potentially invest now in an MLS U 23 league as compared to a relationship like Reno and try to put its players that need development 
into that particular type of club. Is this something that the earthquakes are going to try to do? Well, you have to imagine that the quakes are probably generating powers and are going to be willing to just let let them loose uh, come winter time when they'll actually be able to turn turn over a lot of the expiring contracts and bring in new faces to the mix. Um, in terms of the U23 league, the reserve league, whatever you want to call it, I, I think that they're going to be definitely – a super bullish on it. Uh, I, I actually brought it up to Matias not too long ago. I asked him about the, the U23 league um, that Jeff obviously broke and broke the news on. And, and he was, he was emphatic about it. He was, it sounded like he was very excited and he actually went on to say that a league of that type would bring a lot of legitimacy to, to MLS and would further propel them to be, you know, at a level of, of a Liga MX, you know, who, who, uh, who have these type of leagues in their infrastructure. So uh, I think that the Quakes are definitely going to double down on, on such league. And it gives them that much more of an excuse, just as the coronavirus pandemic did to, you know, Take, take their foot off the, the, the USL throttle, right? Um, as I mentioned, there still will be an informal relationship with USL. Uh, I think that Jeff raises a, a great point. You could easily loan a player. Logistically, it makes sense, right? You get on a plane, you're there in, in an hour. And um, player who's proving to outplay, you know, Players who are under the age of 23 can now play with uh, USL veterans or former MLS players and can then um, eventually make their way into the first team, which is obviously the objective, right? Uh, specifically in Matias's project, it's, it's all about player projection. It's, it's all about uh, fostering the youth and eventually, uh, you know, t- taking them to, to the MLS level. Um, so, I want to imagine that the Quakes are definitely going to make a majority of their moves this winter and that they're going to really, really inspect and and strategize around this new U23 model. Jeff, breaking news very recently is that uh, they're going to need to postpone the USL championship game. This is literally happening right before we recorded this. Can you provide us just some information as to what you're hearing is going on now with the USL championship final? Well, now there's closure. It's actually not postponed. Uh, it's, It's canceled. It's outright canceled. There will be no championship final for the 2020 season. There will be no nominal champion for this 2020 USL season. Uh, The USL now has had to cancel both of its tournament finals for League One and the championship over the span of the last three days. League One's, they awarded the title to Greenville Triumph because League One's format was that the top two teams from the regular season played in a final. Greenville was the team that didn't have positive cases. They also were the team that were going to host, and they were demonstrably better over the course of that season than the rest of the league. That was a pretty easy one to settle. In this case, you have neither team that finished atop their conference, so there was no sort of nominal like regular season then carry that over. They had navigated a difficult playoff. They had virtually identical tiebreakers in terms of points or points per game, however you wanted to look at it. So there was no clear favorite to award that title to. So they decided it's conference champions, Reno 1868 FC won the regular season on points. There you go. That's your hardware for the season. Uh, This was something that, I mean, frankly, it, it's something that was the, the worst case scenario, but a very real possibility ever since the USL announced its protocol saying that teams would be playing across the country in different markets with some of them hosting fans. Once you opened up that doorway, there was always the potential that something this would happen. There were games that were postponed or canceled outright from the regular season on a weekly basis. There were players who were testing positive on a weekly basis. Uh, there were there were definitely some testing complications. There were at least th- well, there were three confirmed staff members of the Tampa Bay Rowdies yesterday, including head coach Neil Collins and one of his assistant coaches, who were going to be unable to participate tomorrow. But then additional testing came back this morning, Saturday. We're recording this with uh, multiple players from the Tampa Bay Rowdies testing positive after they had tested negative on Friday. 
So at that point, you have to take an abundance of caution and say it's going to be at least two weeks before those players recover. Then you would have to have another week, maybe two weeks of training to make sure the teams are sharp because you, ideally you were going to put that game on ESPN's airwaves. And at that point, you're looking at Thanksgiving, you're getting close to December, and you're unsure how this pandemic is going to you know, play out over the next month. So at this point, you just end up canceling it, head down, nobody's happy. There's no celebration about this on any single side of this equation, whether you're a player, you're a fan, you're a neutral, you're a media member, but it is what it is. And MLS not out of the woods with its own season announced this week that they're going to go to the points per game format to decide. That means a team like the Colorado Rapids could end up playing four or five fewer games than teams who are uh, around them in the table and the playoff position will be decided that way. Jeff, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciated having you on the show to go through these uh, very interesting topics about uh, second division soccer players moving from the Quakes affiliate to MLS. It'll be even more interesting if now Minnesota United and the San Jose Earthquakes get to meet in the postseason to be able to have kind of the Reno quakes on the field at the same time. I think a, a lot of fans, uh, at least in the Bay Area and in Nevada regions, would be very interested to see that happen. But thank you so much for coming on the show today. Absolutely. Keep up the great work, you too. All right. Take care.